All right. Now, for all of his life, the next 30 years of his life, Paul is going to say, I changed sides radically from anti Christian to one of its leaders because I saw the resurrected Christ. I, I heard him and I saw him. That's what he will say for the next 30 years. Okay. Now, that's a supernatural thing. Paul claims a supernatural event. A dead man showed back up in his body south of Damascus. Four years after he was killed, supposedly resurrected and ascended into heaven, he showed back up to him personally. The men that were with him knew something had happened, but he's the only one that saw him and talked to him. The others heard the sound and knew something was going on, and maybe the horses were spooked, and they had light. Light is always a symbol of the presence of God, by the way. <laughs> Theophanies, okay? Now, in the 20th century, since Paul argued this all his life, that's why I changed sides. There have been many, many, many attempts to explain what happened to Paul because he is a dominant writer, thinker for the last 20 centuries. So, if you don't buy the miracle thing and God showing up, Jesus showing up, if you don't buy it, then how do you explain why the number one arch enemy of Christianity turned into a, you know, leader? How do you explain it, okay? Some say it's a case of Stockholm Syndrome. This is how you explain it away, attempts to explain it away. He says it was a appearance of God, of Jesus. Um, if it wasn't, then here's, um, do, you, do you remember back, there was a, a, a wealthy, a daughter of a wealthy magnate out in California, Patty Hearst, that was kidnapped by the, uh, uh, a terrorist group in California, and she was kept for ransom. And suddenly one day she was caught on camera with a machine gun in her hand, robbing a bank with her captors, i.e. she switched sides. Okay, so some said he had been uh, intently persecuting uh, Christians so hard for months, and he had ridden six days on his horse, and it was noon, and he was dehydrated, and he had a case of the Stockholm Syndrome, a psychological breakdown. Um, uh, actually, James Stewart and A Man in Christ uh, suggest this much, that he kind of had a meltdown, or he had to identify with, his, with the enemy <laughs> uh, moment, or he had a physiological breakdown. He had, uh, you know, he was dehydrated. He was so driven, so intense that he, he, he lost it. Um, uh, I'm not going to refer to Mur Murphy O'Connor's. That's one that I uh, won't take time to go in. But there's been many uh, uh, attempts to explain away what is the number one uh, miracle in Paul's life. There will be many miracles in Paul's life. Paul will be gifted with charismatic gifts, and he will perform many miracles. But of all the miracles, supernatural events that he experienced, the number one is the appearance of the resurrected Lord on, on the, the road to Damascus. Here's the thing. Uh, Paul was not frustrated. He was not broken. He was uh, healthy. He was intent. He was zealous. He was dangerous. And um, if you look at the rest of his life, you can see all the reasons for which God gave him his own personal appearance of the resurrected Lord. Four years after um, all the appearances to the apostles, okay? Um, uh, there is obvious reason. But here's another thing you have to keep in mind, too. There are 15 to 20, I don't know how many, of the entourage of Paul, okay? They hear and see. They see this man that's been leading them, driving them, lose it completely and go blind. And they lose their leader. What happened to those guys? They were there away from their families, and suddenly there was no purpose. Paul's going to stay there in, in a house three days in blindness. Where'd they go? Where'd they disappear to? What story did they tell when they got back home to Jerusalem? Because they hadn't gone home. They left the mission that they had were on because they lost their leader. He, he had, a, had something happen. They, all they could say is something happened, there was light, there was sound, 
and we lost our leader. <laughs> and they are witnesses. So if you wanted to deny the appearance of the Lord and the resurrected on the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus, you got 20, 15 or 20 guys you could ask, what happened? Did they have all a phys physiological breakdown? Did they have a psychological breakdown? If you're going to accuse Paul of that, what happened to the other 15 or 20 guys on that road? Okay. So there is an important point to be given. Many have tried to explain away the number one event in Paul's life, which is the appearance of the resurrected Lord on a few miles south of the gate that led from Jerusalem all the way into Damascus, okay? Any comments or questions? All right, um, let's go ahead and take a break right here. Uh, take about a five minute break and come back. And what I want you to be thinking of is, um, what is he thinking in three days of blindness? What would you be thinking? If all that you know about him, his training, his upbringing, He's about 27, 28, 29. He's not married. He has been on a mission from God to stop Christianity. And suddenly he knows in about three seconds flat that he was wrong. That you should read Isaiah 53 in a different light. That you should read Deuteronomy 21, 23 in a different light. That all those passages that now uh, uh, messianic prophecies that he studied in school, they all applied, the construction guy from Nazareth. And how are you going to wrap your arms around that? And what are you, on earth are you going to do now? That's going to be the question. So let's come back and talk about that. Take about five minutes. Uh, it's uh, 7.59, so come back about 8.05. Give me the, the best that you have for another 45 or 50 minutes. Brother Edwards, are you teaching a class next semester? Um, with um, one of these classes? I don't know. Um, because I you'll might, be- I, I might know soon. I have not been tasked yet. <laughs> okay. Well, because uh, you'll be gone in both March and I April. Will. Um, I will be gone. So it might have to be uh, seven hours later in Italy. <laughs> Ooh. So uh, I'll have to figure out how to do that time difference thing. Uh, if they ask me to, I'll be glad to do it. Awesome. Um, and um, uh, that's up to the administrators there. Okay. I'm just, uh, just a lowly peon here. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you so much. <laughs> well, that's kind of you. You put up with my, my um, I get going. I'm still passionate about this. <laughs> yes. Um, it's been a privilege all my life. And uh, uh, um, I, I figure I'm going to die with my boots on. Is that an expression you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. I am grateful for um, um, diligent students and scholars like yourself who put up with uh, my way of doing things. And, and I wish you would interrupt more and add your knowledge. But uh, think of this. Jews viewed history in a certain perspective, okay? The word is perspective on the front of this slide right here. There was the patriarchal times, the patriarchal age. There was the uh, uh, mosaic age. And then there was chapter three of all of history, which was gonna be the messianic age. They viewed all of history in three chapters. When you read the stories of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, stories of the life of Christ, his teachings, they're describing the story, even though they're narrating it from three decades, four decades after it happened, they're narrating it from a view to that T that you see in the middle there of the slide is actually supposed to be a cross. I just couldn't draw one. <laughs> okay. The cross is the, in all of human history, in all of time, the cross is the most important event well, the cross and what follows three days later, of course. It is the defining event in all of human history. God created the world, Genesis 1, 2. It was good, it was good, it was good. You and I were very good, and then we blew it. And the rest of the story is how God's going to fix it, God's plan to fix it. And it's going to be through the Messiah, the one to come. And 
the gospels narrate story, the narrative from the perspective of the birth of Christ going up to the cross and then of course the resurrection. On the other hand, the way that Paul looked at it was he didn't think he was in, well, chapter three of all of time. He thought he was still chapter two. He thought the Christians were wrong, that they were still in mosaic dispensation. He did believe that chapter three would happen, but Jesus was not the one. That cross was not the defining factor of history. He was still in chapter two. And when he was told in three seconds flat, no, I am the one who you're persecuting, I mean, his head must have swam. Not only was he guilty of murder and killing and going against God instead of working for God, all of history was different. Chapter three had begun four years before, and he didn't know it. He was having to look back at the cross from four years later and see it differently. It was not the reason for which Jesus wasn't the 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 Messiah, it was the reason for which he was the Messiah. So all of history changed, his perspective. The Christ event is the determining moment to all human history. But Paul's looking at it not from the perspective of the other apostles that saw and walked and talked with Jesus before the cross. He's looking at it from the other side of the cross, kind of like you and I are. You and I are sitting here in 2021, and we're looking back at the cross. So he has the perspective of looking back at the cross because he wasn't there that day. I don't know where he was. He was probably in Jerusalem, but he wasn't at the feet of the cross. That I can pretty much be assured because otherwise, why would he say, who are you when Jesus showed up? Why would he say that? He didn't recognize him. Now that he didn't expect him, true. I don't know if he'd ever had a, you know, angel appear to him. He must have thought he was an angel. He says, sir. Who are you? Are you Gabriel or are you Michael? Are you another unnamed angel? I am the one you are persecuting. The perspective of the Gospels and of Paul's letters could be viewed as having different perspectives. The, the ones who write the rest of the letters of the New Testament are looked at the cross from before the cross to the cross and the open tomb. Paul's looking back. And uh, the effect is the same, of course, but um, think of it in his terms, while your head would be swimming and he needs three days to think about it. That's, a, that's definitely what God thought. You're gonna have to think about this. And by the way, had he ever met, had he ever seen the historical Jesus? I don't know. However, I'm gonna suggest without making too much of it, that he had never seen the historical Jesus. It is possible that the question, who are you, sir, implies non-acquaintance physically. He had never had an a eyesight of heard in the temple courtyards. I don't know why that would have not happened, but it seems to imply it, okay? And that's all I want to say in this slide, and we're not going to go to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16. You can erase that. I'm having to pick and choose some important things, but please make note of this and the rest of this slide. Paul will write 13 letters that we have in the New Testament. He will make some allusions to the historical Jesus Christ, but not very many. And by the way, you could make a longer list of things that he never mentions in his letters. That doesn't mean he doesn't have to, but let's get this straight. All of Paul's letters are written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written. Okay, by all accounts, the Gospels are written about 65. By, by all accounts, Paul's dead by 65. So he doesn't make many allusions to the historical Jesus Christ. He doesn't make very many. And there's a lot of things he just never mentions the transfiguration, never mentions the ascension. Uh, there's a lot of things he doesn't mention. That doesn't mean he doesn't know about them. But um, what is circulating when he's writing these letters is the testimony of the other apostles who were eyewitnesses. And there are prophets that are testifying to this, that ones have the gift of prophecy. And Paul has the gift of prophecy too. But that said, in his letters, he doesn't say a lot about the historical Jesus Christ. He says a few things. And when he 
summarizes the Lord's Supper, for example, 1 Corinthians 11, he talks about, you know, I have passed on to you what uh, has been sent down, he says, okay, that on the, that Jesus Christ was crucified and on the third day he resurrected, and there you go. He, 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 he gives the basics. Uh, he quotes in a speech to the Ephesians, he quotes Jesus as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's in Acts chapter 20. Okay. Now, where'd he get that? He wasn't there when Jesus said that. He either got it from inspiration or he got it from one of the apostles, say Peter, because I know he spent, he's going to spend 15 days with Peter, probably bombarding him with, okay, what did he say then? What did he do? He's, yes, I, I don't deny the inspiration of Paul, but from a human perspective, did he not try to catch up? Because he's the apostle of later. He's the one of four years later. He didn't get to walk and talk with Jesus. He didn't get to do that. And he has three days to think about, well, now what? I, chapter three of human history, the Messianic age, began four years ago. And I missed it. In fact, I was fighting against it. And now what do I do? What, what, how can I serve God now? In, uh, you know, in the condition that I'm in, the person that I am, person that I've been known as, what can I do now? Any comments or questions you have? I thought about how, uh, how much Paul has been enjoying <laughs> Jesus ever since, you know? Yes. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah. All right. Damascus. You know, is there an important geographical place in your life, you know, where you had a major event, you know? Uh, for me, it's Pistoia, okay? Before COVID hit, I was there on several Sundays at a church that's been there for several decades. Pistoia means a lot to me. It's outside of Florence by about 25 kilometers it's about uh, 10 minutes from our campus where i'm going to be in january and there's a church that's been meeting there since the 60s 1960s and uh i was baptized there on december the 9th of 1969 i was baptized there the geographical spot matters to me i was raised in a godly family mother and father dedicated to mission work and and I remember, our, uh, you know, it was cold and the water was very cold and the bathroom was not comfortable. But, you know, going back there and seeing still an active church and taking my study abroad group and helping to bring a lesson and lead singing and with their worship, it's just very meaningful to me. It's going back to my childhood. Well, my beginning of adulthood. I was 13 when I put Christ on in baptism and it became personal, not just a family thing. Faith is personal. So Pistoia is an important geographical place to me. To Paul, there's no doubt that uh, any other place he might have in mind, Damascus is it. Now, it was south of it, it's not in it, but Damascus was the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world when Paul was heading there to arrest Christians. It is mentioned actually in Genesis chapter 14, verse 15. It is the oldest. It's the capital of modern-day Syria, by the way, a uh, place that's hard for you to visit as an American and very dangerous, too. There's still civil war. The Assad regime is uh, uh, still uh, hanging on, thanks to the Russians, to power with weapons. Uh, the Syrians have tried to get rid of them, but they have taken major losses because the Russians stepped in to help the Assad regime, but it's a tragic place Damascus is today, but it's very meaningful to Paul. He was stopped just short of the city of ancient Damascus. He was given time to think inside the city of Damascus. He came out from that, a, a different man, completely different. And let me go ahead and step back and pull up uh, the other slide that I have here, which is this one, uh, let me, yeah, pull it up. Uh, new share. Let me pull it up right here. Um, 
this is just a, a postcard look at I've never been there because it's dangerous and I can't do it. Let me pull it up. This is a postcard of modern day capital of Syria. It has a lot of military and tanks and, and, uh, and uh, this is where it's at. Modern day Syria, you're looking at it. Um, this is a modern day subdivision of the Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern world. Uh, this is the country. This is where the capital of Damascus is. Uh, in the recent years, we've heard a lot about ISIS and Aleppo and um, Euphrates River. You're looking at it right here. But look where Damascus is. It's, it's right in the capital of modern day Syria is right by the border with a, another small country that's ravaged by uh, factions called um, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, uh, Beirut being the major city there. This is instead the ancient city of Damascus. It's near the sea, but it has several waterways. The uh, archaeological reconstruction of it, uh, the main reason I bring it to your attention is because uh, it's easy to identify still to this day in modern day Syria, Damascus, Syria, the uh, street where Paul's going to go after he becomes blind, can't see, has to be led by it. And he uh, stays in a street called Straight. There are three different, um, you could say, tourist places that you could see that are connected with Paul in modern day Damascus. Okay. The street called Straight. Now, on this map here, the straight street looks straight, but it wasn't. In fact, it, it was meant in the opposite way. Uh, it was very crooked <laughs> and it was ironically called straight. Today on a map like this, it looks more straight than it was. Um, a, if you and I could visit Damascus today, a Muslim guide would uh, take us Christians to uh, the street called Straight. This is an image before the Assad regime took takes this actually, I think early 1900s. So it's colorized of the wall and uh, the street called Straight. And there it is, the gate uh, before cars and things like that. I think it's late, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, so we're looking at, now please know that Damascus has been, of course, uh, sacked, well, war, has destroyed it, been rebuilt, but it's been continuously inhabited. They rebuilt right on the spot after warfare, but the level of the street called Straight that's in the narrative of the conversion of Paul is lower than the one you're looking at here. So here are other images of the street called Straight and modern day uh, Damascus or modern being 19th and 20th century. And that's what these is with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, donkeys and, horses and before there was a modern day locomotion. Um, the level of the street called straight would be actually about 20 feet, not just two or three feet below this one, okay? Um, if you were and I were to visit Damascus today, a guide would show us the house of Ananias. That of course is another important figure. He's the one that will be called upon to go uh, uh, talk to, to book, go uh, connect with Paul, the most dangerous um, uh, figure to early Christianity in its early years. Um, and so there is a, uh, a, a, a complex around what is supposedly the house of Ananias. The house of Ananias is, looks like a chapel, looks like a chapel from the Gothic period, uh, 11th, 12th century. Um, it is the right level uh, of the Damascus of the time of Paul, but it's highly unlikely that uh, anybody would have identified the house of Ananias as being here, a um, place where Paul would have stayed um, and been uh, found his faith uh, or, or been baptized. Uh, but you will be shown a house of Ananias as a tourist item in this street. One more one more thing in Damascus that is connected to the Paul, the street, the house of Ananias, and then this part of the wall. Uh, it looks a way too um, nice to be part of the south wall of the ancient city of Damascus. Now, it could be that it was reconstructed during the occupation by the Crusaders. 
what you see in the center of there is supposedly what used to be a window. In the life of Paul, I think twice, he had to escape the city of Damascus by a window, not once, but twice. Uh, after his first few days or weeks in Damascus, he was chased by angry Jews, and he had to be let down in a basket, kind of like this uh, image you see here. And there's a supposedly chapel of Paul uh, that's still commemorated in what they say is part of the ancient wall of Damascus on the south side. And that supposedly is the window through which he escaped once, if not twice. He mentions the second time he escaped through a window in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right at the last verse. He says, I escaped. The, uh, he was being pursued by envoys of the Nabataean or Arabian king, uh, Radus IV. He was chased by Jews once. He was chased by uh, envoys of a king once. He escaped both times from a window. It's what my understanding is. So anyway, quick references to Damascus. Damascus is, in the life of Paul, um, a very, very important uh, 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 you know, place. It's where he met the resurrected Jesus. It's where, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull back up. Um, it's where he had three days to think about it. Um, and it is ironically, are you seeing back again what I'm looking at, uh, Paul's conversion? Yes, okay. Um, it is a place also that has traditions associated today in Jewish eschatology, Islamic eschatology, and the question is, does it have any importance in Christian eschatology? Eschatology means end time things. In Jewish traditions, there, is, uh, uh, there are some sects of Orthodox Judaism today that think that that geographical city is a demarcation point, a very special point in which some things will happen at the end of time, at the end of time, okay? It is definitely true that in Muslim Islamic eschatology, it's seen as a place where the final battle between good and evil will happen. Um, there will be some major events. It's interesting and only interesting that Damascus is seen as a geographical spot for some great events at the end of the history of the world, end of time, okay? Now, here's the point. In Christian narrative, teaching, thoughts, whatever, there is nothing about Damascus except for Paul. <laughs> for Paul, Damascus is the beginning of uh, the second half of his life, the most important part of his life, the realization that, oh no, uh, I was wrong, now what? Three days with scales on us, not being able to see, and thinking, what am I going to do now? And so there you go. Please make note of one last thing on the slide. There are some theologians that say that during his days there, Paul had contact with a um, not very well-known sect of Jews called the Zadokites, and they got some of his teachings from them. So they question whether Paul owes some Zadokites, some of the teachings he will incorporate in his gospel later on. There is no proof that Paul had contact with Zadokites. The Zadokites are possibly a branch of the Essenes, which are the ones that will leave major works down there at Qumran by the Dead Sea, okay? But there's no evidence that Paul and the Zedekites had any contact during his days and weeks in the city of Damascus. Any questions? So do you see the map? There is the trip, there's Jerusalem in the year 34 AD. He, he and an entourage of men make it there and just short of that. By the way, Damascus is when you leave Palestine, leave the promised land. That's where he encounters Jesus and it changed everything. Here's another um, map. There's Jerusalem down there by the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. Now go way up at the top, you see Damascus. In the times of the Roman Empire, it was in the province of Syria. It was called Syria and Cilicia in the Roman provincial administration. That's where he met Jesus and everything changed. 
and you have three accounts. Make sure that you read Acts 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. Any, any comments you have here? I'm going to keep you for about 15 more minutes. Um, I think I told some of you. I was in a fire back when I was directing Huff. Mark, do you remember that? Oh. I had an accident and I was blinded for three days. I was in an Italian hospital. It was an explosion and I had my glasses on and my glasses were reduced to a just a, a little, <laughs> they, were, they were burned by the fire and my, I lost my vision for about three days. And uh, so I do know I have recovered all of that. My ear was a black blob and it grew back. God is amazing how he lets the body recreate itself. And uh, um, I do know what it's like to be blind for three days. Um, your other senses just go 100 miles per hour, especially your thinking, your hearing, everything you taste even. Um, although I couldn't taste much, to be honest with you, I was being spoon fed broth because <laughs> I had second and third degree burns on 35% of my body and, and I couldn't see. So, um, so I was in um, about a thousand needles of pain every day and it took me about 10 days to recover uh, to some degree from that, but I was blind for three days. Um, what did Paul do? He had three days to think about it. And I, I guess I'm missing here um, I wanted to see something very important. Oh, I didn't put it there. I'm trying to see, did I miss it? I guess I need to ask because I don't remember where I put it in my notes. Was Paul saved on the road to Damascus? Question. Was he saved? Yes or no? No, no. Why not, Paolo? Because uh, uh, different reasons. Uh, number one, uh, he did not uh, confess. He was not baptized. Uh, he had to think through what was happening. Uh, like, uh, uh, I think, and right says, interestingly to me, he has to rethink the God that he served because now he had evidence that uh, uh, Jesus was connected with the God that has been uh, his God all his life. So all these things together. But if you want just one answer, he was not baptized until when I just make him uh, recuperate the vision. Exactly. Why would he be baptized if he's already saved? He had to he had to choose. He had to think. And that's where Ananias comes in, right? You know, Jews did ablutions where you dunk yourself. But baptism is where somebody else does it. And it's not the power doesn't lie in the baptizer. It lies in the choice and the witnesses. And it's about water, and it's about salvation, it's about choice. He knew intellectually that he was wrong, and he needed three days to think about it. What on earth am I going to do now? He still had to choose to serve God with the new knowledge that he had. And that is marked his choice and his salvation in Christ. He is forgiven of all those people he murdered and arrested. He's forgiven by God. The slate is wiped clean, right? He's not going to deny it. But in God's eyes, that's a reset button, and it's called baptism. And there's nothing magic about the water, but that's why Ananias has to be involved, right? All of the above. Paul is not saved on the Damascus Road. Paul is saved three days later when he's baptized into Christ. You get to choose. He had to choose Christ. He knew Christ to be the Messiah now. And then he had to choose him. And, and in that act, he had to deny the saving nature of the Mosaic law, right? 
He had to deny everything he'd grown up with, thinking that that was the answer. Now he knows, no, that was the uh, prefiguring. It was what led to Christ. <laughs> and he had three days to wrap his arms around that. And when he came out, he came out at the same speed with which he was going against God. He starts going for God. <laughs> That's an amazing transformation. Amazing. He is going to be zealously quarterback for the opposing team in the Super Bowl of life. First half of his life, he thought he was playing on the right team. And then he comes out of his Damascus event, which is the you know halftime of his life, three days, and he comes out and he's quarterback for the other team. And he's going to be going as hard or harder than he ever was before. Any other comments you want to make? Uh, there is one interesting thing to me is uh, uh, when uh, before you were quoting when Paul said that he has been appointed from uh, his mother womb mm -hmm. by God. Uh, well, in those in those three days, he had to accept the calling that God gave him before mm -hmm. you were asking calling or conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the points of the Calvinistic the Calvinism has a, a big issue to understand or to accept. Uh, yeah, God uh, called Paul from the womb of his mother to be the apostle that each accepted to be in those three days in which he was blind. He still had to choose. Yes. Free will is there. There is not predestination the way Calvinism defines it. There's predestination the way... Paul defines it. Paul uses the word, which is not the same thing as Calvinism. That's mm -hmm. correct. So thank you for pointing that out. Anything else you, you want to add, uh, Miss Sandy or Mark? Well, uh, let's do this last thing, because we're going to have to say for next time, call or conversion. I want to discuss that, okay? Because um, I do have it in your notes, and I want to walk through it when we start next time. But what happened? after he came out if you read acts chapter 9 he comes out well let's let me read it let's go to if you have your bibles there let's go to acts, acts 9 since i'm uh, gonna save the color conversion question for next time i'm reading from acts chapter 9 and reading um look at verse uh, i'm picking up with when he is um uh, uh, Verse 18, Acts chapter 9, verse 18, okay? So, sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> and it's a, uh, it's a vendor. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope they don't try again. I don't know why they're trying to reach me at 8.35 at night, but uh, I guess they think I work late. So, <laughs> uh, I'm in verse, chapter 9, verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. So for three days, he didn't eat. For three days, he was in blindness. And then the, the um, choice, the, 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 which is signified by his baptism with water, he, his, his, uh, his uh, slate is wiped clean before God. The grace of God comes into his life. And then there's... Uh, these words. For some days he was with the disciples in Damascus. What did he do after he was baptized? This is Luke's account in Acts chapter 9. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. He was going to go to synagogues to ask, where are any Christians and arrest people? Instead, now he's going into synagogues saying, he is the son of God. Well, okay, what a transformation. They had heard about him. They were fearful of him. And he comes in. Now, here's the thing. Is he faking it? Is he a spy? Is this undercover? For years, Christians are going to believe this is an act, okay? Three years later in Jerusalem, they're still going to believe that Paul is putting on a front. He's doing it undercover. He's acting like he's faking it. Now, how is this going to play out? He's now saying he, Jesus, is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. 
and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not, <coughs> excuse me, come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But in spite of the fact that there was skepticism and fear, even within the synagogues, Saul increased all the more in strength. He didn't, this is, I see the, this amazing spirit within Paul, uh, undaunted, no matter who turns him down, runs from him, uh, skeptical of his newfound faith, okay? Uh, he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He proved, I saw him, I heard him. He is the Christ. What an amazing story. Now, um, verse 23, when many days passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but the plot became known to Saul. Here's plot number one against his life. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him, how many plots against his life did you have to run from? How many times did you tell the story of your conversion? How many times did you have to run from a plot? It starts from the very beginning. Um, you either love this guy or you hate this guy. If you're a Jew, uh, yeah, uh, you're not, you're not uh, neutral to him. <laughs> he, he begs your antipathy or your animosity, or he can convicts you. But his passion and his, uh, his way of doing things is just uh, remarkable in so many ways. Um, their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering by a basket. That's time number one that he escapes <coughs> and he leaves. Uh, so where does he go? Please make note. Um, Acts chapter nine, Luke drops it right here. He doesn't tell us. He simply says he escapes uh, from Damascus. Where you and I are going to get uh, the rest of the story, fill in, is from Galatians, the letter that Paul will write in 49. He will make reference to, in chapter 1, brief bi biographical item, very rare for Paul. He refers to the fact that after he went for three years into Arabia, he escaped from this plot against his life and went into the Nabataean kingdom. There was a kingdom of the king of Redus, the fourth there. He escaped there and stayed there three years. Now, can you imagine Paul just uh, taking a job and chilling for three years in Arabia? I don't think so. When he comes back after three years, so it's now the year 37 in the biography that you have, the chronology in your notes that I gave you, he comes back to Damascus again from the Arabian kingdom in Saudi Arabia today, okay? He comes back and he's chased by envoys of the Nabataean king. That's in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. And once again, he has to escape this plot against his life from a very different source. Why was he chased by soldiers of the Nabataean king? Obviously he had done stuff out in Arabia that got him the animosity of the local ruler there. And he returns to Damascus and he has to leave it again in the year 37. And uh, he goes for the first time since leaving in 34, he will go to Jerusalem. But nobody wants to open the door in the Christian community. Christianity has grown leaps and bounds in the meanwhile in Jerusalem. In the in the many thousands. And the number one persecutor, everybody is unsure what happened to him. He's gone. He disappears for three years. We now know he was in Arabia. He comes back, and there is not a door of a Christian in Jerusalem willing to be open to this man. They think he is that devious, that dangerous. No way, Jose. If not for the important role of one man who sticks his neck out. That would be Barnabas. And we will uh, pick up there uh, next time in the story. 37, Jerusalem, first visit back as an apostle of Jesus Christ in the year 37 
important role of Barnabas in introducing him. And by the way, there's going to be plot number three against him. The plots keep coming. He either is beloved or he is worthy of death. He will experience this a lot in his life um, as he proceeds to be serving the cause of Christ instead of opposing it. I don't know how old he was. If he was born in the first decade, he's about 30, 33 years old, something like that. And now is the rest of his life as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Any comments or questions? All right, I know I'm one day behind in the readings. Read the chapter that deals with the first missionary journey, the Apostle Paul, if you would, in Ren to Right. And, uh, and uh, you will catch up with me. I made this syllabus with only seven class days, and they moved it to eight. So the one that I missed last Monday, I will be able to make up. <laughs> so uh, just stay ahead of me by reading N.T. Wright's account of the first missionary journey, and we'll be good to go. Any questions? Any comments? Uh, the, By the way, just, yes. The test, the test is coming at some point. Um, I don't. Uh, I lost after, track. After the week five, right? Five. Okay. Still. Okay. We are tonight in three. Oh, okay. Not four. <laughs> okay. Because I blew it. <laughs> no, no. So forgive me. Uh, so after five, I will send you that test. Okay, great. And then the last test, the second one, will be over the last two class days. Okay. So more on the first test, less on the last test. Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for asking, Mark. I thank hope you, you are blessed this week. I hope you stay faithful in Christ and, uh, and are inspired by the, by the conversion of Paul. I am every time I tell mm -hmm. the story, I count it. Um, what he's going to do what one man can do if all the talents are put to the service, what one woman can do if all the opportunities and occasions and talents are put to the service of God. What can one, one person do? Um, a lot. That's the question. And that's what you and I have to do in our time with our opportunities and our talents and our knowledge and our skills is use it for the kingdom of heaven because he will return and we are to serve him until that day.